Excellent. Thank you. And a special thanks to Lindsay, who invited me to be part of this conversation of Boccaccio's uh, influence on Chaucer, or in the specific case of the Decameron on the Canterbury Tales. That's what I'm interested in, and that's where we're going in today's paper. It must have been, and indeed it was, obvious to people uh, almost as soon as the Decameron became available in England that there was some connection uh, between these two texts. But as time went on, uh, scholars, and scholars entered into the discussion, and because they couldn't prove it, because they couldn't prove the influence, they have shifted in the other direction and decided, no, Chaucer probably didn't know it. Or if he did, only superficially. He didn't have it before him as he was writing. Now, I entered into this conversation when I published a book in 2017 in which I argued strongly that Chaucer knew the Decameron better than most of us do, that he read it closely and he was thinking about it really intently. The evidence I used there was Decameron 810, the last story of the eighth day, which I put on the cover of the book, but which you know scholars overlooked because th th they weren't all that interested in it. We can come back to it in questions. I'd be happy to take this up in questions, but I'm talking here about this topic because I don't really want to go over that argument again. I think it's pretty conclusive, but the reviews are sort of saying on the book, or many of them, that if you don't have verbal echoes, then you can't claim that something is the source of one of the Canterbury Tales. And all I like to say here is, that's nuts. That's completely crazy when it comes right down to it. By the way, the, the video, the YouTube video is something uh, that I put up because it records a lecture I gave at Oxford. If you'd like to get the main argument of the book without paying for it, go to the YouTube video and, and take a look and see what you think there. Um, but why, why is this obsession with verbal echoes at all? Why is there this obsession? And again, I think we understand it when you look at Troilus and the Philostrato. It's pretty clear that large amounts, large chunks of what the source text make their way into Chaucer's. And so we expect Chaucer, perhaps, to use sources in that way. But as you turn to the Canterbury Tales, it's immediately apparent that Chaucer uses his sources in a multitude of ways. Compare, say, the, the uh, second nun's tale, The Legend of St. Cecilia, with the one it's paired with in the Canterbury Tales, The Canon's Yeoman's Tale. Direct translation, God only knows where Chaucer's taking it from for The Canon's Yeoman's Tale. Why would Chaucer always use Boccaccio in exactly the same way? I, I, to be honest, I can't understand it. But I, I, I bring this all up because I'm not offering you in today's paper stronger evidence than I presented in the book. I'm not claiming that this is going to be finally the conclusive evidence that will convince other people. Instead, I'm starting from the premise that one intelligent writer, Chaucer, read another intelligent writer's work, Boccaccio's uh, Decameron, carefully, and used it in really interesting ways. Today, what I'd like to talk about is the way he used the first novella of the Decameron, depicted in this slide from a uh, uh, Paris manuscript uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So this is, of course, the story of Ser Caparello, the notary from Prato, who goes to Burgundy in order to collect some debts for his employer, falls ill, and dies. That's the basic story. We don't have that narrative in the Canterbury Tales. There's nothing really close to that story in the Canterbury Tales. So to argue for its influence, I've got to step back and claim that Chaucer is as interested in the structure of the Canterbury Tales as he is in individual narratives. So the sort of 
preliminary idea I'd like you to wrap your minds around is that Chaucer's fragments are designed around particular themes in the same way that Boccaccio's days are controlled by the topics proposed by the success of Queens and Kings. Fragments equal days, or the fragments develop directly out of Boccaccio's days. So what are the fragments of the Canterbury Tales? I'll try and do this quickly. This, of course, is the opening of the Canterbury Tales in the two most famous manuscripts, Hangard and Ellesmere. Just incredibly beautiful. They make the point that Chaucer eventually decided how he wanted the work to begin, and scribes knew this, or the scribe, because these are both by Adam Pinkhurst, knew this, and were able to represent that. And both manuscripts carry on this beautiful, regular presentation of text until something quite surprising happens. This is the Cook's Tale, the end of what scholars call the first fragment in the Ellesmere manuscript. In Hengert, it's the exact same thing. Part of the page left blank, but Hengert also says, of this Cook's Tale, Chaucer made no more. The scribe Adam couldn't find any more of the text, but he thought he might. And so he left a blank so he could insert other folios in if he had to. But Ellesmere, I've used this rather than Hengard because the you can sort of see on what's been cut off on the extreme side, this side, my side <laughs> of this particular slide. Uh, a more elaborate border announcing the beginning of the second fragment or of a new fragment in the mind of the scribe. So these are what the fragments are. Groups of texts linked in the Canterbury Tales by narrative connections. The knight draws the first straw, the miller objects to the knight's tale. The reeve thinks that you know the, the miller is crazy or unfair in what he's just said. And the cook is amused by the whole thing. Chaucer builds that narrative connection. And that then gets carried over into the manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. Now, there are 80 manuscripts. There are you know some that work with things in different ways. And we could go into much more uh, discussion of that if you'd like to. But this basic idea of fragments being Chaucer's way of organizing his material around specific themes is what I'd like to, to work with today. This came up in the book a little bit because although I relied on 810 as the best evidence that Chaucer knew the Decameron, I also argued that the origin of the Canterbury uh, Tales is Lakishka's outburst at the beginning of the sixth day in the Decameron. Lakishka, that just incredible voice, dragged out of the kitchen because she's having an argument with Tindero and you know, forced to explain what's been going on. Tindero tries to speak, and Lakishka just bursts out, Fady, bestia, dwarm, look at that beast of a man. And off she goes. I mean, her voice just takes over. And she tells the story about what her uh, friend's wedding night really was like, rather than the crazy view that men would have about this particular thing. It's an incredible thing, because it's the one story in the, Canterbury, uh, in the Decameron told by a lower class character. And so it stands out and is absolutely, you know, uh, it, it just incredibly brilliant. I think Chaucer picks it up in the Canon's Yeoman's Tale, but again, that's a separate paper. We could go off there again in questions if anyone's interested. Um, but for today, what I want is that Chaucer, uh, excuse me, that Boccaccio uses Lakishka's interruption as the basis for two more of the topics of the following days, not the sixth day, but the seventh and the eighth. Dianeo says, yeah, Lakishka's right. You know, 
But it's not just lower class women who behave this way, it's all women. So let's tell stories about the tricks women play on men. That becomes day seven. And then day eight, with a female queen given the power to say, well, no, let's tell stories about the tricks men play on women. You guys should have to you know, put up with what you've just subject, uh, subjected us to. Uh, but she says, no, I'm not going to do it. Let's tell stories generally about the tricks people play on each other. And that then becomes the eighth day of the Decameron. What interests me is that Chaucer takes Lakishka's outburst and turns it into the first two fragments of the Canterbury Tales. In the book, I argue that he really wanted the marriage group first and only gradually realized that he had to start with the class group, the one talking about social hierarchies first. But both are Lakishka's themes. She's a lower class woman who argues that women need power. She's the wife of Bath, but she's also the start of the Miller's interruption and objection to the Knight's Tale. So we have fragments one and two growing out of Lakishka's interruption. And I could keep going, we could run through them all, but what I'd like to use for the remaining minutes of this paper is to get back to the effect of, or the influence of Decameron 1-1 on the last of the fragments that Chaucer wrote. So back to the Boccaccio story for a minute. Uh, Ser Cepterello, of course, realizes he's going to die. He realizes his hosts are upset because they think they're going to get in trouble because he won't be given a Christian burial, and that'll reflect badly on him. So he says, you know, send in the most holy priest that you know, and I'll confess. I will provide a full confession and you know, come what may, uh, the, let the chips fall where they may. So the most holy priest in the town shows up and Sir Caparello begins confessing. His friends are stunned because he lies. He just lies and lies and lies. And you think there's gonna be some kind of you know, interesting verbal play that's gonna take place where he's both lying and telling the truth, but it doesn't happen, he just simply lies. And the priest believes every word of it. So absolves him, allows him a Christian burial, and then preaches so eloquently on his sanctity that a cult develops. And the story ends with Boccaccio, or the, the teller of the story informing us, that a cult develops and miracles take place. It's a great story, but it's an especially great story to begin a collection of stories with. How do we sort out, you know, truth from falsity? And how, what role do stories play in this incredibly complicated question? I, I've always wondered why Chaucer didn't use it. And again, thanks to Lindsay for inviting me to do this, because it suddenly occurred to me he did. It's just that he plays it out across the final fragment of the Canterbury Tales. The Manciple's Tale, the story of Apollo and his mistress and his raven or crow, depending on whose version you're reading, uh, who sees the mistress um, committing infidelity. In Ovid, in the sources uh, telling of this, the mistress is also pregnant and so in Ovid's version, uh, Apollo's child, even though he kills his mistress, that child is born and becomes Aesculapius, becomes the first, you know, the founder of medicine. So something good grows out of this story. Chaucer takes parts of it, but changes it radically. There's nothing good that happens. Apollo kills his mistress, but then turns on the bird and decides that the bird is guilty for having said something untrue. And although it's completely clear that what the bird has said is true, Apollo punishes the bird, turns him black, and takes away his power of speech. And the story ends with, be silent, don't say anything, because truth doesn't matter. There's no, th no importance to truth itself. 
very dark, incredibly dark. It's paired narratively with the Parsons tale. So there's no fragment nine and 10 as uh, you know, the additions up to this particular point have done it. There's really those two stories that are paired. The Parsons tale, of course, not being a tale at all. It's simply the combination of a treatise on penance with a treatise on the seven deadly sins. So the focus is on confession and all of the sins that we need to confess for. It's unreadable in many ways. I mean, in, in some ways you can pull individual details out and apply them to many of the tales within the Canterbury Tales, but you also realize that you're stretching as you do it, that it doesn't really answer the complicated questions that the uh, Canterbury Tales has raised. So that then leads into the retraction, Chaucer's own confession, and his desire to be give, forgiven for the works that he's written. Specifically, the Canterbury Tales, Thilke that sown into Sinna, those which lead people to sin. Now, what do you do with that? You know, which tales lead to sin? Does the knight's tale lead to sin? Does the miller's tale lead to sin? Does the re do you know, do what we have to do, what we're forced to do, is exactly what Boccaccio has set us up to think about in the first novella of the Decameron. We don't have that divine perspective. We may consider that divine perspective, but we don't know it. All we have are the fictions, and it's from those fictions, from those fictional accounts, that we have to try and create some kind of meaning for our lives within the world in which we live. It's not, do you see what I've tried to do at least? This is not a story that Chaucer retold. You're not gonna find verbal echoes here, but it's a story stunning idea that Boccaccio introduced into his uh, collection in a very prominent way and Chaucer used in his as well. That's what I had for you today. Thank you. I appreciate it and look forward to the questions.